Yes, I've got a few glasses on. I can see. I got, I got tickled. Have you ever seen in your rear view mirror where it says objects in mirror are closer than they appear? You ever seen that sign with the little thing on your car? Rear view mirror? I got these glasses yesterday. Of course, you realize how bad your last glasses were when you put your new glasses on. How blind you look. You know, and I'm like, whoa. So I'm walking out of there and I'm staggering around like a drunk. You know, trying to get used to things being clear and on top of it. So I go out to Walmart to pick up my medication. And I'm coming out to Walmart, walking across to go to my car. And I look down at this car, you know, and it looked to me like a car about to run over. So I took off. Well, he was actually on the other end of the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> he drove by and kind of looked at me real funny. And I just pointed at my glasses. I said, look, man. I can see real clear right now. It just felt like you were right on top of me. Anyway, yeah, I staggered around at Walmart for a little bit. David and Lori Cantor saw me yesterday. I just got a mile. And they said, they said, you're kind of walking like this. I said, yeah. I said, I can see real good. That's the problem. <laughs> so, yeah, I can see. And the part I really like about these glasses is I can see under them. My other pair I couldn't see under Brother George, I put a CD in there. We'll do number six. 649. Look, you got your hymn. Get you a hymn. We'll turn number 649. We'll sing Mansion Over the Hilltop. I don't know about you, but I look forward to the day I get my Mansion Over the Hilltop. Thank you.
you so much for the privilege and the opportunity to be back in the house tonight. So thankful for each and every one that's come out to be with us. And Father, we pray now that you just meet with us tonight and help us as we expound upon your word. Uh, Father, we've got several uh, prayer measures we're going to mention here in a few moments. And Father, we always know the needs of each and every one of those folks in line. And Father, we pray you get involved. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Good to have you tonight. And I appreciate you coming out and being with us at the Wednesday night uh, prayer meeting. Hope you've had a good week so far this week. Hope God has blessed you. I'm pretty sure you've probably watched the news uh, like I have. Please remember those poor folks down there in Texas. Uh, I saw that today, a little bit of that today. And I tell you what, it, it's pretty bad. I was talking to somebody today who has a relative that lives down around Dallas and Fort Worth. He said he woke up to minus five below zero the other day. And uh, three degrees, I think, today is what the temperature was uh, for a lot of So do you remember those folks down there? I mean, people without power. Uh, of course, I think some folks have also died, uh, sadly. So, so do remember those people down there uh, in your prayers. I mean, just how crazy this is. They're actually getting a lot of snow in Nashville tonight, I think. But we're not, I think, according to the weather, I looked at it before I walked over here. They said we're still in the, the rain category. So uh, we're supposed to get a little bit more rain tonight. But do remember those folks uh, in your prayer. Hopefully they get some relief uh, from a lot of that uh, cold air. Uh, do got uh, several here uh, on the prayer list. I'll, uh, I'll read a few of them off here. Uh, some of these we mentioned this uh, past uh, Sunday. Do some updates too. Uh, remember the family of uh, Coy Lane. That was a man we requested prayer for. His family had to make a decision. He, he did pass away uh, late Sunday night. So do remember his family uh, in your prayers. And also, too, this one came through uh, in the prayer group today. Don Hoyt uh, passed away. So remember his family uh, in your prayers. And then uh, Brother Will Evans, uh, he did get to go home from the hospital. I was talking to Elsie yesterday. He had to go back to the hospital. He's got flu. He had to go back in. So remember him in your prayers. He's really had a rough go with him and Elsie both had over the last uh, three to four weeks. So do remember them in your prayers. And then this is another uh, new one here. Uh, Doug's brother, Franklin, uh, is in ICU at uh, Franklin, uh, sorry, Holston Valley. So remember him in your prayers. We don't have any uh, details yet as to what's wrong. Uh, he doesn't have COVID or anything like that, but he is having some problems breathing. So do remember him in your prayers. And then my aunt, uh, Inez, uh, she did end up having had two stints uh, put in Monday. I talked to Tad uh, Monday about her. Uh, she actually, her widow maker was 99% blocked. So the doctor said, it's only by God's grace you got in here and got this done. So uh, do remember her in your prayers. She did get to go back home uh, Monday evening. Remember my brother in your prayers, my younger brother, Jason? Uh, he's got to go back Monday. They sent back his report for his... Uh, Place he had took off his nose with his skin cancer. So he has to go back uh, Monday. Uh, some of you that are familiar with this, they usually keep taking it off until the markings are clean. So he's got to have that done Monday. So remember him in your prayers. I think it's on his nose. So uh, please remember him. The family Swanson is still uh, in the, I know she's back at the nursing home now, but do continue to remember her uh, in your prayers. And Karen DeLoach, uh, got an update from Brandon. They have to put her on medication, which is what her out of loss. So do continue to remember her uh, in your prayers as well. And Annie Carnett, uh, Philip mentioned this, his mother-in-law, uh, Sunday night, she's on blood thinning. So do remember her in your prayers. And then uh, also, too, Carol Justice, this is the lady that uh, we requested prayer for Sunday. The prayer request of Brandon Taylor. Uh, she is afraid she'll lose her foot. I haven't gotten an update back as to whether or not uh, she was able to keep it. So do remember that lady in your prayers. And Dean Hartman and Alan Trivet. And then this is one here that Taylor's given me, Christy Carrigan. Uh, she had failed to cause some brain damage. Is that right, Taylor? Yeah. Okay. It was okay. And they, uh, they said that she, uh, Taylor just told me a few moments ago that it looked like she may make it. So do remember her and remember her family in your prayers. And then uh, I had a chance uh, uh, taking some stuff to the, to the uh, nursing home for uh, Sandra. I got a chance to talk to Chuck Russell. If y'all remember, he was a manager at Beagle Braves and at Pizza Inc. You probably, if you saw him, you know who I was talking about. I went to school with him, graduated high school, and we had prayer for him before. Uh, his cancer had went to remission. Well, he told me uh, there Monday his cancer had come back. Uh, 
he's got to go to Nashville. Uh, matter of fact, I think it's uh, in the middle of next month uh, in uh, March. We're going to have a bone marrow transplant. His brother uh, is a hundred percent match, so that's the good news there. He's going to have to stay down there. He told me anywhere between three and four months after he has the transplant done. So uh, please remember him in your prayers. He's really had a hard go of it, uh, battling cancer off and on. So be praying for him. They feel pretty good about it. Treatment, what they're going to do. Uh, they think they can get his cancer back in remission. So please remember him, uh, especially Russ. And then uh, Sister Lola, speaking of, of going down to Nashville in March, Lois is still on, on track uh, to go down in the early part of uh, March for her surgery. So we can remember her, Grady Holder, that is supposed to have his knee replacement surgery a week from tomorrow. So we do remember him. Matter of fact, Brother George is uh, about to come up uh, next month too. Uh, and love Brother John. He has not a date yet, but uh, remember both those men in your prayers. And then uh, please remember uh, Carolyn's niece's family. And then uh, Olivia Shepherd, this is also a prayer request uh, that we got Sunday from uh, Don and Mary, that's their granddaughter. So we can remember her in your prayers and Jimmy Hill, Carrie's son, and then Dan and Carrie, and then Felicia a few months ago, uh, gave me a little update on the little baby. Uh, Tyler, uh, he's, got a, he has, he's going down to uh, Memphis. We're going to be doing some work on him with his lungs and around his heart and his heart back. So do remember him in your prayers. He's still not able to eat or do anything uh, molecule or anything like that. But uh, it looks like they have a direction and an idea of what they need to do. So please remember that little fellow uh, in your prayers. Hopefully uh, he continues to get stronger and gets feeling better. Of course, uh, Sister Terry McNeil, uh, do continue to remember her in your prayers. And then uh, also, too, uh, Greg's brother, uh, Glenn's brother. Thank you. Yeah, remember uh, Sister Joe, the, the ligaments in her foot have come loose. And uh, she's trying to get, I think she went and got a boot, right? Got a boot to nail. And that's going back to the doctor Friday. So remember Joe Hughes in your prayers. He's in a lot of pain with that. I, I can sympathize with her. I know not until I made any few months ago, just to give you an idea how painful, how rough that is. I rolled my ankle when I was 22 years old real bad. I was class five spring. And the first thing that Emergency room doctor said when he walked in there, he said, you should have broke it. And the uh, same thing the orthopedic doctor said, he said, you should have broke it. And I remember, I never forget, he looked at me and he said, it'd be about nine months. And I looked at him, I said, you mean nine weeks? He said, no, you heard me correctly, nine months. And he was not kidding. It took every bit of nine months before my foot and ankle got back to normal. That was the craziest thing. So, and I was only 22 at the time. So I, I can imagine, I can imagine kind of pain she's probably in and, and then what's going on there. So remember, remember Joe in your prayers. I can 
some seed today. Y'all look pretty good. There you go, there you go. It's, uh, they, they was awake tonight. They went, there you go. That, that's your cue. Y'all look pretty good tonight. Even Greg back there. He looks real good. Look good, Greg. Hey, even that Raiders coat back there. You look good. Even the Raiders coat. Good to see you tonight. Appreciate you coming out. There you go, smiley. I can see the smiley faces, Wayne. It makes me feel so good. I tell you, he stuck in glasses. I went there yesterday. He stuck his glasses on. He said, read these lines right here. I first stuck them on my face, and I stood up, and I was like, whoa. He said, yeah. He said, give yourself a minute. And I kind of take a step at a time. I fell out the ground. and going to jump up and grab me. But I walked over to that place. He said, read these lines here. So I read those lines. He said, good. You got 20, 20 minutes. He said, uh, your glasses work. I put my other glasses on to see where they were at. They were at 24. <laughs> so yeah, there's a little bit of a difference there. <laughs> yeah, I'd be scared too driving with me on the road. <laughs> you realize how blind you are when you get something like that done. Let's go back to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much once again for all you do for us. We're blessed you give us each and every day. Uh, Father, as I mentioned a few moments ago, my heart does go out. Uh, just watching a little bit of the news today about these folks down in Texas. Father, unfortunately, some people have lost their lives down there because of freezing temperatures. Uh, Father, we pray for those families down there. Father, hopefully for too long, uh, they can get some uh, <clears throat> relief from the cold. Uh, Father, do keep to pray for all these we mentioned tonight on our prayer list. Uh, we have a couple families there, the, the Lane family and, and the Ford family. Father, I pray you comfort those two families uh, as only you can. And Father, I pray you just magnify your presence with them. Lord, we are thankful. Some that we mentioned tonight, uh, if they've got some improvement, they're doing better. Uh, Father, we thank you for that. I heard a few moments ago uh, about one that uh, the Blue Cross was on. Father, we thank you for intervening on his behalf. Father, we pray for each and every one of these we mentioned tonight. That we ask you to please get involved in their situations and touch their lives. Uh, Father, maybe they'll be able to go home from the hospital and, and maybe get back and, and be in service to you and their heart's desire. Uh, Father, we ask you now to be with us as we continue. Our studies upon your word. Use us as a vessel tonight. Speak to us always as only you can. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23. you before we get started. I know it says in my Bible, and it probably says it in your Bible too. It says something along the lines of the last words of David. These are not the last words of David. Okay? Uh, he's not on his deathbed or anything like that. Uh, this is kind of just a what I think is implied by this is his last public proclamation. <clears throat> and his last praise that he actually gave in public uh, amongst others. And he goes in and talks uh, about several things. And, and makes mention also, too, of some of the men that served with him. Now, if you, if you read on, and I'll, I'll, I'll skip ahead just a little bit, I, I know it mentions 30 men that actually, or it says he had 30 men, but actually 37 names are mentioned. Well, if you go back and you look, he's mentioned some guys who have died during that time. So that's why you have 37 and not just 30. In other words, there was you know, more guys that were involved. <clears throat> they had lost their lives, but he always seemed to have around 30 uh, that was considered his personal guard. But anyways, in, in the last words of David, of course, last week he was covering uh, some of his phrases. It says in verse 1, it says, Now these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and the sweet psalmist of Israel. Now, he gave him about four introductions there. Uh, first off, he's called the son of Jesse. All right? You, you go back and you look at his family's beginnings. And, you know, Jesse was not somebody known in the kingdom. Uh, as far as we know, he wasn't known to be a warrior or anything like that. As a matter of fact, he's known to be a farmer and a chef, basically. And, you know, some of his sons actually were uh, fighting with Saul when David showed up, of course, and slew the lion. But I think what David, what's being mentioned here is David's humble beginnings. 
You know, we, we look back at our own lives, and a lot of us have humble beginnings, but I'm going to tell you what, God can do great things with humble beginnings, amen? And the son of Jesse, I think, exemplifies that from David. And he says, the man who was raised up on high, <clears throat> of course, David, you know, he was a 13 to 14 year old shepherd boy, and by the time he was 30 years old, he was the king of Israel. Uh, you know, amazing how things can change. You know, we look back over our life. And what God's done for us, you know, I, I was uh, watching something the other day uh, about a guy that was involved, unfortunately, <clears throat> that was in, in addiction and so forth, and he got his life straightened out, and now he's preaching the gospel and even running organizations. This is somewhere out, ironically, out in Oklahoma uh, in Texas in that area, and he was talking about where he was at and, and how things changed in just a year's time, what the Lord done for him in his life. Now, you know, David, he went from shepherd boy and then that day Samuel showed up, anointed king of Israel. He was God's anointed king at that moment. The minute he got anointed. But he didn't take the throne, as we know. He took the throne over the nation of Judah when he was about age 23, 24, somewhere in there. But then didn't rule over all Israel to about the age of 30. But anyways, he was God's anointed king. So he was a humble person. The son of Jesse started out with humble beginnings. And then he was raised up on high. Think about you and I. Any child of God has humble beginnings, but praise God, like we sung a few moments ago, you got a mansion on the hilltop to look forward to. You're going to get raised on high one day. As we're fond of saying, our help does not come from the front of us, behind us, left or right, and certainly will not come from below us. Our help comes from up. You know, look up our redemption draw now. So he had humble beginnings. He was raised up on high. It says, next to her, the anointed of the God of Jacob. Yes. Samuel anointed David the next king. We, we remember <clears throat> that story from our studies. You know, those sons of Jesse walked in there, and the first one walked in, and he had kind of the physique that, that, that Saul had. You know, he was kind of a tall feller, probably had some broad shoulders, some good-looking arms, and kind of looked the part of the king, and and, and Samuel got up and said, surely this is he. And God said, sit down. He said, I don't see as men see. He said, I look upon the heart and it's not him. You know, and he goes through all those boys of Jesse. And I'm pretty sure some of them look pretty impressive. And Samuel sat there and Jesse probably scratched his head, thought to himself, you know, this is about the strongest men that I've got in my house. You, what's going on here? And Samuel said, look, you've got to have another one somewhere. He says, we can't leave until you bring the one God wants. So they stayed there and they went out and got David. And David walks in, 13, 14 years old, probably barely five foot tall, if that. Walks in there and ruddy and so forth. And, and, and God says, this is what I want you to anoint. I've always wondered how, how everybody's jaw hit the ground when he anointed David. You ever wonder that sometimes? I mean, you've got all these dignitaries of Israel. <clears throat> and, and in and around Bethlehem, you know, with Jesse, and you think about all the people that went down there saying, they're all down there expecting to anoint some strong-looking man, and all of a sudden they, they anoint this kid. That's basically what he was, a kid. And you can imagine the jaws hitting the ground, and everybody looking like, are you kidding me? And Samuel said, no, I'm not kidding you. This is God's anointing. Here's the thing tonight. If you're saved tonight, you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, you're God's anointing. Do you know that? In Revelation, our Revelation study tomorrow, we're going to talk about them 144,000 that's got God's seal. Guess what? You know who has a seal from God today? The born again Christian does. Amen. It's mentioned on several occasions in the New Testament about the seal that God seals his own children with to protect you and take care of you. So here David, you know, he goes from humble beginnings, raised up on high to be a king, he receives God's protection as the anointed of God of Jacob. Okay? He has now got God's protection. And let's, let's face it. Saul tried to kill him. The Philistines tried to kill him. He probably had battles and wars. His own son tried to kill him. But yet God still protected him. Look at the next thing here. It is an F. It says, the sweet psalmist of Israel. This is the one thing that separates David from the rest of the kings. Even Hezekiah. Okay? Hezekiah, to our knowledge, didn't have any type of psalms the way David had. Now, Solomon had some wisdom that he gave out to folks. You can find that in the Psalm of Solomon. But as far as a psalmist goes, 
David stands apart. You know, David had that unique skill of taking how he felt about the Lord and putting it into words and putting it into the Psalms. I guess you could call him the first gospel songwriter. I remember a preacher years ago made that comment. If you want to know who the very first gospel songwriter is, I understand the gospel, the Old Testament predates the gospel, but he said, here's the thing. David was your first hymnal writer, if you will. He just had that unique ability to take how he felt his heart, how he felt his mind, his feelings, and put those down on paper to be read and to be sung. Now we know that David was also, being a little bit unique from the rest of the kings of Israel, he was also a musician. He played the harp. He was so skilled at playing the harp, as you know, he was brought in to play the harp for Saul to calm the evil spirit. Now he must be a pretty talented player to be able to do that. So you take that into account as well as his ability to write psalms, and you've got the entire book of psalms. Uh, a lot of those psalms come from David. We just read to you some other psalms that he'd given in the previous chapter, and you see the talent that David has. And here's the thing. David took the talent God gave him and used it for God's glory. That's what's important about it. So if you look at this, a man of humble beginnings who was raised up on high by the God of heaven, protected as he was anointed of God of Jacob, and took his talents and used them for God's will. That's the way you could read that introduction. He wanted to do God's will. Nowhere in that introduction does it say that David was perfect. David was about as human as a kid. That's one thing that I have picked up on. I've studied David's story before, but for whatever reason this time, and studying along on Wednesday night, I never realized how really human David really is until you really look at his life. Okay? But nowhere does it say David was perfect. He's very human. But he loved the Lord. And that's what matters. So we see there in verse 2, it says, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. David had a relationship with the Lord. And that's what he's trying to tell the nation of Israel. This is a very public proclamation being put out. That's why you have that. He's trying to get the nation of Israel to understand anybody that God takes with humble beginnings, set them on high, he'll give them his protection. He will also, if you'll just use your talents for him, but here's the thing, have a relationship with him. Know him. Know what he expects from you. And the only way you can do that is have a relationship with him. And that's what David's trying to portray to the nation here. The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. David said, I tried to relate what God was telling me as best that I can. Once again, doesn't mean that David was perfect. David's just trying to relate what God's word is. And trying to tell the nation, this is what the Lord wants you to do. Now later on, when he has what I would call probably his last authoritative talks with, with Solomon about what he needs to do and rule of the kingdom and so forth, he tries once again to relate that type of, of, of uh, feelings to Solomon. That importance of relationship with God. You stay faithful to the Lord, the Lord will stay faithful to you. His word will be within you if you stay faithful to him. He goes on there in verse 3. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me, He that ruleth over me and must be just, ruling in the fear of God. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And David epitomizes that. Once again, was David perfect? No. David made mistakes, you better believe. But David understood that you better fear God if you want to be effective in ruling. He did understand that. And he also passed that on to his son Solomon. He says, the rock of Israel spake to me. You know, sometimes we wonder, and I know in studying the Bible, I'm pretty hurt my junior and David, some of you that in Felicia's and Nadine, you study, everybody here study the Bible. A lot of times you see Christ brought out in the Old Testament. And I think in verse 3, where it says, the rock of Israel spake to me. Who else is called the rock? Jesus is. You know, I, 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 my studies of the word of God, 
I know today we have the Holy Spirit, which tries to lead God and direct our lives. All right? In other words, try to guide us to do things that are righteous, keep us from things that are unrighteous. In my studies of the Old Testament, a lot of times I think Christ filled that role for kings and tried to fill that role, I should say. What I mean by that is, all he could do was tell them what they need to do, what direction they need to take. Whether or not they took that direction was up to them. But I think Christ did a lot of that in the Old Testament. Speaking to the prophets, speaking to the kings of Israel, speaking to the people in Israel, trying to lead, guide, and direct our lives. Like I said, here's the thing. God, God, nor the Father, nor the Son, is going to force the issue. Free will has always been available. And will always be that way. Okay? But that does not hinder any of the Trinity from trying their best to lead, guide, and direct your lives in the direction you ought to take. And I believe David is relating that now. In his relationship with God, he felt like the Lord Jesus Christ at times would try to guide him in the direction that he needed to go. He that ruled over men must be just. Okay? It doesn't say that you're just all the time, but it goes back to that striving for the mastery. You must strive to be just at all times. Because at the end of the day, David is not only the king, he's also the judge. Sometimes we forget that. To the king of Israel, David had set judgment law. I don't know what his judgment days were, but he had to do it quite a bit. If he wasn't on the battlefield leading his armies, he was sitting there at the place of judgment. They would bring rules to him or judgments to him to make judgments on against people. Now, some of the more important or lesser important things would be handled by folks underneath him, but the important things were brought to him. Okay? So you've got to be just, ruling in the fear of God. He says, And he shall be as the light of the morning when the sun riseth, even a morning without clouds as a tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. He shall be as the light of the morning. You know, if you're ruling justly as best as you can, and you've got the fear of God in your life, the Bible says, he shall be as a light in the morning. That means a light of God's got to be shining on you. Or shining through you. See, people know when the ruling of God is coming from somebody's mouth. You know, a good example of that, of course, is Solomon. If you recall Solomon, they brought that baby in there, that, uh, those two moms in there, and that baby, and the one said, no, it's mine. The other said, it's, no, it's mine. And, and Solomon, of course, made that famous rule. And he said, cut the baby in two, give half to one, half to the other. And, of course, the real mother jumped up and said, no. He said, you give it to her. I want to see the child live. And Solomon said, that's the mom right there. Give her the baby. Okay? And everybody, the Bible says in the verses after that, everybody began to really fear Solomon because he had the judgment of God on him. That is the light. The reason they feared him is because the light of God was shining through him. Okay? You know, used to, as preachers and, and people of the Lord, if you would preach the truth of God's Word, folks would have respect for that. You say, preacher, why is that not happening today? Because darkness is enveloping. You're living in the last days, friend. Okay? You're in the last days. Darkness is trying its best to take the light out. The only way it's going to take the light out is when Christ takes the light out himself. I repeat once again, I'm going to say a lot tomorrow. You don't want to be here when that happens. Make sure your ticket's punched. But here we see with David, his ruling and his judgments caused the light of God to shine out. It says, when the sun rises, even a morning without clouds, as a tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. You know, one thing I always dread at my house is when I mow the yard and it starts raining. I can stand there in my window of my kitchen and watch that sorry grass grow. And then when that sun comes out, it just seems like that grass has grown two inches higher than it was when I mowed it. And I stand there and I think to myself, I'm not mowing it again. I'm not going to do it. And then the next day will come, I'm not going to do that. Then the next day will come, guess what? I'm on the mower mowing it again. That's what happens when the sun comes out. I mean, you'll sit there and you'll cut that grass and you have the old grass that you cut over top of the new grass and by golly, it'll rain. When that sun comes out, that grass will just shoot right up through that old grass. And 
there he is back again. And that's the people of the Lord there. When the sun comes out, we grow. Amen. Think about it. When the light shines on your life, you grow. And that's what the nation of Israel was seeing through David. When he was really in tune with the Lord as he should be, and trying to do the will of God, God's light was really shined out of him. And the nation grew because of it. Grew spiritually, that is. Okay? So, he says, Even as grass spring on earth by clear shining after rain. Although my house be not so with God, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant. He says, Although my house be not so with God, David says, I'm not perfect. I made my share of mistakes. And we've gone over some of those mistakes that David made and the things that really cost him in his life and, and cost him dearly, you know, with his family. But he says on there, yet he hath made with me an everlasting covenant. Here's one thing you can be assured of now. God keeps his word. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then they will keep their word and bring you into heaven one day. Amen. Whether you go in debt or whether you go by rapture. It will happen. God keeps his promises. Amen. He keeps his promises in this world. That he will take care of you and watch over you. And provide his protection. That is the one thing David understood there. Even though his house was not always perfect. At times sin had crept in and got in a hole. God, David always knew God would keep his end up. He would always keep up his end of the covenant and his promise. He said he's made an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and sure. David said, no matter what happened in my life, he says, one thing I knew. When I laid my head down at night, I knew God still sat on the throne. When I woke up the next morning, God still sat on the throne. When I went through my life during the day, I knew God was still on the throne. That would never change. I'm glad tonight, no matter what happens, change of power in the state, change of power in the county, city, the nation, or the world, God still sits on the throne. Amen. As long as I know him as my personal Savior, and I belong to him, I ain't got nothing to worry about. I can lay my head down tonight and know that if I don't wake up, I'll see the Lord. I can lay my head down tonight and know if the trump of the rapture of the church takes place, I'm out of here. Amen. That's what matters. Because those things are sure. God has promised those things. And if I do wake up in the morning, I know the Lord's going to be with me. He says he'll never leave nor forsake. Amen. He always takes care of his children. David knew those things were sure. For this is all my salvation. That's right. My salvation does not rest in anything on this planet. Okay? It doesn't rest in anything in this universe. It rests in Jesus Christ alone. Amen. And that's it. The Bible teaches us that. Our salvation rests in Him. It is sad tonight that folks are being fed lies from the devil and told falsifications and said, if you'll do this or you'll do that or you'll believe this or you believe that, Jesus Christ is still the way, the truth, and the life. He's still the one that gave His life to pay the sin debt. And because of that, he's the one that has the keys to death, hell, and the grave. Yes. If you want eternal life, you better know the one that holds the keys to death. Amen. Amen. And Jesus Christ is that one. David says he is all my salvation. God is all my salvation and nothing else. Amen. He goes on there and he says, all my desire. David says I'm not perfect from day to day. I make my share of mistakes from day to day. But at least I strive to do what God's will is for my life. And do the best that I can for the Lord that the Lord can use me in a very positive way to help others. Now, I think today I chance to talk to somebody. I mistook you for somebody else. I don't think bad about wearing these masks at times. You, you don't know who you're talking to. But, but anyways, I mistook you for somebody else. And he said, that's no problem. He said, I understand. So we got talking and everything. And you know, he promised me he'd come to church this Sunday morning. So hopefully we will. So looking forward to him being here. But anyway, we got talking about things going on in the world, things happening, stuff like that, things taking place. And, and he told me, he says, yeah, he says, I'm saved. Don't, uh, the Lord's my Savior. And I said, that's great. I said, that's the most important thing any man can do today is to make sure he's saved. He said, yeah, it's all of our salvation, but also, too, it should be our desire to serve every day. Every opportunity that we get, we ought to take advantage of. Amen. Amen. 
If the Lord is truly your desire, when opportunities come up, you'll take them. Okay? And that's what David is saying there. He is all my desire, although he make it not to grow. He said, uh oh. Although he make it not to grow. Because that's David's responsibility. Relationship is a two way street. God will do his part. Okay? He will reach out, reach down, never leave nor forsake. Provide his word for you. The spirit will actually help guide you through his word at times. All those things the Lord will provide for you, but you've got to do your part. Amen. Nobody ever had a relationship by sitting there doing nothing. Right. You've got to work on it. Amen. David understood that for his relationship to God to grow, David's got to take steps to make that happen. He's got to do things to make that happen. Number one, doing the will of God. You're not going to have a relationship with the Lord if you don't do the will of the Lord. And David learned that real quick. As we go back over David's life, when God was involved or when David got the Lord involved and done what the Lord's will would be for his life, things went pretty smoothly. When David did not get the Lord involved, and therefore did not have the will of God prevail in his life, things got what? They got rocky. And David learned, you know what? God's involved, things go well. God's not involved, things don't go so well. You say, preacher, if that's the case, why did he keep him involved in all aspects of his life? Here's my question for you. Why don't you? You know, once again, as I told you, the number one thing I've learned about David is he's pretty human. Just like us. He fails just like we do. He gets lazy just like we do. Amen. Lazy in our spiritual lives. We don't always get the Lord involved. We think, well, some things just ain't worth the Lord's time. Everything is worth the Lord's time. Amen. Are you willing to get him involved in it? Is the question. Okay? But David says he make it not to grow. No, you've got to work at it. David has learned. But the sons of Belial shall be all of them as thorns thrust away because they cannot be taken with hands. David said, I've learned something too. The sons of Belial refers to those people who do wickedness. He says, those guys there shall be all as thorns thrust away because they cannot be taken with hands. He says, there are some people out there that will never bend to the will of God. David says, I have learned that in my lifetime. I'm pretty sure everybody here tonight, watching on Facebook tonight, same thing. You've seen people in your lifetime, they're just not going to be in the will of God unless God lays them flat on their back. And even if they get laid flat on their back, they're still going to be a little stubborn. David says, I've seen people like that in my life. He says, they cannot be taken. But he says, the Lord deals with them. He says, but the man that shall touch them must be fenced with iron and the staff of a spear." And they shall be utterly burned with fire in the same place. If people refuse to be reached, then they will pay the consequences. And that's what David has learned. See, if the nation of Israel had listened closely to these public words of David, what we call the last public words of David, and had taken them to heart, they may have lasted longer. So they, they got this in their mind, the grass is green on the other side, or these false kings, or false, I should say, false gods that some of these kings ran after. I can do what I want to do. And they became ingrained in that false worship, in that attitude of whatever I want to do, I can do it, and I'm not accountable for it. And their hearts became hard. And we know how that story ends. They ended up being conquered. God rolled back his protection. All the things David said God would give, God rolled it back. They would not listen. They would not do what the Lord asked them to do. They would not grow the relationship. They went after the false gods, the falsifications of life, the falsifications of other nations. And they ended up being utterly burned with fire in the same place. 
Israel was not defeated in battle. Israel was not defeated in Syria. Israel was defeated in Israel. In Jerusalem. In Samaria, which was the capital of the northern tribe. They were defeated there. Those armies actually came in and conquered them in their own lands. You know, I, I don't know if David meant to be a prophet here, but I think he's trying his best to get the nation of Israel, you know, listen. Learn from my life, I think is what David is trying to say in these words here. Learn from my life. You know, step back and look at my life, David says. You know, today, in 2021, we have the opportunity, we can step back and learn from David's life. We can see when things went well with David, why did they go well? God was involved. He got God involved. Things went bad in David's life, why did they go bad? He let sin come in. Okay? He kept the Lord out. And things did not go good. David says here, you know, I've learned too that if you continue on that road, your heart will get harder and harder. He says you'll have more and more problems. You can go back to the sin with the Uriah and the Hittite where he had committed that sin with Bathsheba. You know, David tried to keep that hid, keep that hid, keep that hid. Everybody in David's throne room knew what had happened. But David still went along like nothing was wrong. And that little baby died consequence of David's sin. David is telling the nation of Israel, learn from my mistakes. Keep the relationship with the Lord where it needs to be. Stay faithful to Him. He provides you the protection that you need because if you go down this path of stubbornness and sinfulness and you continue down that path, it gets hard for you to get reached. And you'll end up consumed by fire. Boy, if they only listen. They only took that to heart and paid attention. Next week, we'll talk about some of David's mighty men. He's got quite a few of them. Quite a few of them. My Father in heaven, we thank you so much for Bible study tonight. Thank you for the word of God. The privilege that we have tonight to, to, to learn from these men and, and to maybe help us in our walk with you. The common denominator is very simple. Keep the Lord actively involved in your life. It's, it's just that simple. The more actively involved he is in your life, the easier it can be. Father, I pray that you help us tonight. As we dismiss from here, watch over, protect us, keep us in your care. Give us safety to travel back to our home. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Don't forget to prophecy study tomorrow at 1 o'clock.